Welcome everyone to our annual uh, webcast that is sponsored by the SJSU iSchool Leadership and Management Program Advisory Committee. Um, I would like to um, acknowledge our um, wonderful committee. Uh, I co-chair it with Dr. Deborah Hicks, um, who has been uh, working uh, alongside uh, with me for several years on this uh, annual webcast, and to the members of our committee, um, Philip Carter, uh, who uh, is from the Starkville, uh, and I apologize, I've um, omitted his county where he's from, and I had practiced uh, saying it too. It, it's quite a, an in-depth uh, county name, so I won't even try that now. But Philip Carter, Amanda Folk at Ohio State, Melissa, Melissa Frazier Arnott, um, who is at the Library of Parliament in Canada. Uh, Kelvin Watson, Executive Director of Las Vegas Clark County Library District. And Daphne Wood, who is the Director of Planning and Organizational Development at Vancouver Public Library. I would also like to uh, thank all of our participants who are here today. Um, we're really glad to see you and to let you know that this will be recorded um, and posted on the iSchool website uh, so people can see it at a later time. I would like to introduce um, Calvin Watson. As I said, he's a member of our committee. Um, he's executive director of the Las Vegas Clark County Library District, um, and he is going to moderate our session today. Um, Calvin is regarded as one of the most highly respected thought leaders in the library industry, and he's credited with expanding his customer service base in multiple different library management roles through outreach to the underserved and diverse populations. One example of many is to note his partnership with the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada, which made digital access to the library available to bus riders. And it has um, been awarded acknowledgement and prizes. And it's just, as I said, one of the many examples of leadership uh, that Calvin has um, brought to the organizations that he has been with. So um, welcome, Calvin. Thank you for moderating this session. I am going to uh, stop sharing and turn things over to you. All right. Thank you, Sue. So I'm happy to be uh, moderating this afternoon, and I am going to be introducing our two presenters uh, for this afternoon. And so first, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Nicole Cook. Dr. Cook is the Augusta Baker Endowed Chair and Professor at the School of Library and Information Science at the University of South Carolina. Her research focuses on critical cultural information studies in libraries and her advocacy for social justice have earned recognition in the library profession. I've known Dr. Cook for many, many years, and I'm happy to be uh, ha having this discussion and having everybody hear from her today. And so next, I would like to introduce you to um, Pamela Espinoza de los Monterreos. I've messed that up bad, but I, I practiced beforehand. So I apologize uh, for butchering her name a little bit there. But Pamela is the associate Professor, Latin American Studies Librarian at The Ohio State University. And um, her work uh, around Latin studies is something that she's gonna share and uh, around um, her work. The majority of her career um, in, before becoming a librarian was spent in business administration and nonprofit development. And so um, that's, that's a, a great background. I actually also have a business background and an MBA. And so I'm not sure who's going to go first. I, we didn't flip coins. So actually, Pamela, why don't you go first? And then Dr. Cook, you after uh, after that. And then we're going to open it up for Q&A based on the time that we have left. I am Pamela Espinosa de los Monteros. I'm also an organizational consultant with Imagine Lucha Lab. And I'm just finishing up a master's in positive organizational development and change. 
Uh, many of the things that you're going to hear today come from, from this work. I wanted to offer a fresh perspective on DEI, maybe one that you may be unfamiliar with. And this approach is coming to you after 25 years of engagement in intercultural exchange in California, New York, Arizona, Mexico, and now Ohio. And my outreach efforts have predominantly supported immigrant communities. I've worked alongside DREAMers, international students, and the undocumented. And while I've worked with many people in my community, many more that are outside of it. And I've been fortunate to hold professional roles where I can prioritize DEI work with very few exceptions. And throughout this journey, I just wanted to share that this work has never been easy. Uh, there has always been resistance and pushback, and more than that, a ton of apathy. So much like we continue to experience now, it's really seldom been a smooth ride. It has not given me titles. You probably have never heard my name. <laughs> and it certainly has not made me rich. Um, unless you count the emotional toll and pain it has given to me in my life. Um, and I'm sharing you these challenges because what I'm going to present to you may sound overly joyful and positive. And what I wanted to reassure you is that this is coming from being immersed in the mud and grappling with adversity. And I wanted to share with you that uh, what I'm sharing today is my battle scars. So here we go. Are you all ready? You all ready? So here it is. So the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change, they're really revealing this dynamics of a world that is global and interdependent where people that can reach and affect us from where we are. Can the interdependence and interconnected political, economic, and ecological systems help to shift our conceptions of self and other? And if so, can a new model of DEI help to explore and navigate and prov provocatively test the benefit of our interdependence? While we have DEI has often approached its advancements through the lens of moral or social justice, the business case for diversity or the advocacy and activism, and each of them have their own strengths, their literature, their methodology. Perhaps it may be time and beneficial to really reframe and start with empowered interdependence, shifting our consciousness from I to we and us through practices of interconnection. Empowered interdependence is neither a new or a unique idea, but rather a timeless principle by many that is practiced by traditional indigenous populations all over the world, like the Zulu concept of Ubuntu, which is roughly translated as I am what I am because of who we all are, and the belief that we are defined by the compassion and the humanity we share towards others. And this frame of interdependence may help to focus not on tasks or collections or power or aspects of identity, but on relationality to drive workplace place practices, strategies, services, and leadership styles that really reinforce our ability to interact and collaborate in ways that are generative to one another. So here is a beautiful images from the James Webb Space Telescope. And what I am proposing is that DEI is about seeing the unseen universe of interdependence. Can we seek to see and embrace our planet's plurality, each person's distinctiveness and value? Can we operate from a premise that we are human and we are also part of nature, that we are interconnected? And can we learn from indigenous ways of knowing and being that consider the whole person physically, emotion, 
spiritual and intellectual as an interconnected to the land and the relationships we have with others. And this concept of unity drives many indigenous communities and leaders to cultivate this very positive energy of oneness through harmonious and interdependent relationships and, ba and balance. So what would be possible, I ask you, if every day we went to work and we were given this opportunity to practice, learn, and with time excel, especially across the dynamics of difference. And perhaps it may be the first time in our ancestral lines that we are that we give ourselves this opportunity to intentionally connect, listen to, learn from, create with, and grow in the company of others with a distinct origin story than our own. Will we be the first to build those bridges that are not yet there, knowing it's not easy even when there is love there and almost impossible when there is none at all? So how can we help people to practice these important relational skills at different levels of the system, at the peer level, at the group level, at the organizational level, and also at the community level? So I ask you to help me think about how do we connect and that connecting even more across difference when it's meaningfully done and sustainably requires elevating and leveraging our highest human strengths. So in the chat, would you indulge me and could you share what you think are humans greatest and most positive qualities that support connection? What do you think they are? Go ahead and write them in the chat. Curiosity, understanding, altruism, empathy. Yes, empathy, that's right. Connectedness, absolutely. So as you all said, sense of time. Yep, humor, that's right. Belonging, playfulness, joy, all of those things. And many of you are sharing these uh, so to collaborate with curiosity, with wonder and awe, being openness to multiple ideas, to have to give people dignity. If you look at this list, you can also see central tenets of what the mission of the library also is. And so I also want to ask you, tell me where in the library are we creating spaces, projects, and conditions to harness these strengths on a daily basis. And I'm gonna to get to that more in a moment, but getting to the first question that we were asked to discuss for this panel, when people ask, what are you doing in DEI? You can respond, we are cultivating our highest human strengths. And you can make it central that what you're working on is humility, what you're working on is curiosity, what you're working on is kindness, what you're working on is appreciation. And actually using those words might also help to advance it. So that is just proposition number one. The next is to lead with EDI values. It really requires humanizing the workplace. So going from efficiency and deadlines and productivity to efficiency, deadlines and productivity, but also relationships, also joy, also happy people and fulfilling meaningful work. And this is gonna require switching fluidly between balancing task and relationships. And this is a skill that require us to use our brains in distinct ways that are more complex. So here is the great work of uh, Richard Boyatzis, who is a business professor at Case Western Reserve. And he has been studying coaching, coaching with compassion. If you've heard of resonant leadership or emotional intelligence, this is all Richard Boyatzis. He also is doing things about neuroscience. 
And one of the things that he is helping us to understand as he's looking at the brains of, ex of different executives and high functioning leaders is that we use different networks in our brain when we are task oriented and when we are relationship oriented. So when we are in a task positive network. It is one that we're using to problem solve, to focus our attention, to make decisions, to control our actions. In other words, to get things done. Many of the traditional aspects of what librarianship was once. And as we activate this network, we suppress the default mode network, which plays a central role in our emotional self-awareness, our social cognition, our ethical decision-making. It is also strongly linked with creativity and insightful problem solving. So here's the contradiction. We need both these networks to be operating to advance EDI. And so the opportunity with EDI and leadership in greater complexity is learning how to support one another to switch back and forth between these two different networks where often when we are at work, we are rewarded for our analytical selves. We are not necessarily rewarded for our relationship building skills. And DEI, that is central part of it. So I'm gonna suggest to you that when you're working with others on matters of DEI, consider what network you are on, consider what network others are on, consider the networks that we all need to be on to move forward. And if you tend to be stronger in one network than in others, those are neural pathways that you have developed over time. So if you are really good at task, then define the task as fostering relationships. And if you are really good at relationships, identify the relationship embedded within the task. So that's just one way that we can help to move EDI forward. And now here's the very provocative one. We need to radically shift our consciousness to make this work sustainable. That means that it helps. How can you make somebody do this like I do with no pay to do this with no recognition? How do you make people do this without titles? How do you make people intrinsically motivated to do this work and altruistically motivated to do this work? Well, one of the things is that we need to support people to feel interconnectedness. So experiencing our lives as deeply interconnected physically, emotionally, and spiritually changes how we think and act. We become more empathetic and compassionate. We begin to see ourselves as one with the world. We become more coherent in ourselves and in our interactions with others and with all forms of life. And the experience of wholeness and connectedness is the foundation for altering a person's behavior and decision-making in organizations as in life. And this is coming from Chris Laszlo, who is working in flourishing enterprise, business for good, and also uh, looking at quantum leadership. And so if experiencing wholeness and interconnectedness are essential practices to shift our mindset to have empathy and compassion and see social justice as an important tenant for our work, I'm going to ask you, what are the practices that are most effective in cultivating this practice? Is it empirical rational? Is it a book club? Is that, how, is that where you feel wholeness? Is it social cultural norms, values, and attitude? Is it a really nice strategic plan or a statement or a cultural event? Is it power coercive? Mm -hmm. <laughs> could you... <laughs> Could you have, could you feel uh, wholeness because I say that we are connected and therefore if you do not feel it, I will cancel you? That's how we're going to do it. Or will we do it through direct intuitive practices? Because we don't have 20 minutes to uh, go through each of them more, I will give you the answer. It is direct intuitive practices. So... 
We cannot control others. We can control ourselves, our self-development, our self-growth. A lot of time people would ask me, why are you still doing this work? How could you do this work after everything that has happened? And it's because I spent a lot of time doing this work, which makes me see even the setbacks and the mistakes in very different ways. So some of the direct intuitive practices are mindful meditation, journaling when we are uh, thinking back on all of the experiences that have happened to us, body scanning, understanding that our bodies are sharing with us many different insights into our world. Are we in tune with those? Um, I'm going to talk about Barbara Fredrickson's work in just a little bit about loving kindness meditations and how it has been shown that if you do these types of meditative practices, how it builds not only your likelihood to feel more positive emotions, but also how it changes your idea of self and other. And appreciative inquiry, we will talk a lot in a little bit. And I really want to call out this one about nature, nature immersion spending time, really making those land acknowledgements real by re rediscovering our relationship to the land. So these are, so you don't have to believe me because there's research here from business, from public health, and from positive psychology that is sharing what this work does. And I wanted to call out again here, this little graph, this is a, uh, they were looking at businesses doing good, what makes a business support to a flourishing enterprise. And if you see here, this huge divide here, this big divide is a mindset shift. It takes a mind shift, mindset shift to redesign and reframe management practices that are more systemic, holistic, and that looking at interdependent organizational paradigms, uh, which are necessary so that we can switch to looking at having a positive role in our communities and our cultures and society. So to recap, what does it mean to lead with EDI values? Well, one is to really understand how our brains work. What is the neuroscience behind what is happening? What are the habits that we're cultivating in our minds in the way that we filter? And start with interconnectedness. Not others' interconnectedness, your own. That's, that's all that we really can sometimes have influence around. And very lastly, I don't have too much time to share on this, but when we're thinking about organizational practices that we can we can uh, approach is thinking that we have decades and decades of understanding now of what is the gaps and issues around DEI, but we have very little information about solutions or they're not as well elevated up into the literature. And so one of the ways that we can seek to learn more about what is working inside of our organizations is to use appreciative inquiry, which is a life-centric, strength-based approach that provocatively shifts from a diagnostic, top-down, and deficit-based focus of problem solving to a generative search for the best in individuals and its organization. And it helps us to do that through asking appreciative questions that use storytelling in context to understand what is working right. So um, I really invite you to learn more about what appreciative inquiry is. It really does also work against our desire to always look at threats and what is negative and actually to reshift and look at what is the best in this person? What is going right? And not for toxic positivity, but in, in the idea that that's where we can grow. We can reinforce. What can we do to add into the system that would make its weaknesses irrelevant? 
And we are doing this now with uh, Janice Jagoshevsky, who is my consulting partner with Janice J Consulting. And we are working with OhioNet, uh, which is a library consortia here in Ohio, where we are seeking to better understand what are the meaningful organizational practices that have most impacted and supported BIPOC librarians to thrive across their LIS careers. And so some of the questions that we're asking them is reflecting on what inclusion means to you personally. Recall a time when a library colleague stood out for making you feel seen, heard, valued, and included. When did that happen? How did it happen? What was the impact of you over time? What were the behaviors and specific actions that made that meaningful for you? And, and as we're doing these interviews, we're getting a better understanding of what are what are the role of BIPOC librarians to support their flourishing and success? What is the roles of mentors and leaders? What is the role of an inclusive culture? And we're able to say concretely, here are the things you're already doing. Please amplify these things. And so for the last uh, question that we were asked, how to implement organizational training, I would recommend to experiment with positive organizational development and change models like appreciative inquiry. So become an expert on infectious gratitude. Become an expert on how to bring new voices to the table. Become an expert about failing forward as a pathway to success. These are the things that we don't know yet, how they work inside of a library. How can we help and bring that forward? So lastly, it's less about moving a mountain and most about planting the seeds. What are the seeds that we need to plant for today? And that's all, let's keep talking. Here's my contact information. Thank you all for hearing these different ideas. Thank you very much, Pamela. Very uh, interesting and I look forward to having a few minutes for the Q&A so we can get some more uh, information uh, from you as well. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Nicole Cook. Thank you so much. And thank you to San Jose and the committee for inviting me. And it's always great to be with my good friend, Kelvin. And Pamela, thank you so much for your very thoughtful and really provocative um, presentation. Uh, and I think you and the audience will see that we have so much in common, which I knew we would, but i um, grateful that I, I think my presentation will certainly uh, piggyback on yours. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, leading libraries with EDI values uh, and specifically culturally responsive leadership. And so this will address uh, specifically two of the questions, you know, how do we uh, lead with EDI values and how do we incorporate EDI values into our existing leadership practices? And so much what you heard uh, in the previous presentation, um, you know, it isn't just about saying, I have EDI values and I'm going to incorporate them, you know, into the workplace. And really what it comes down to is there are lots of organizations that talk the talk, but don't walk the walk, right? So they'll say they have, you know, EDI values, but they may not actually believe it, right? They might not actually espouse it and operationalize it into their daily practice, so as you can see here, inclusion isn't just inviting someone to sit at your table, it's actually believing that they belong there. And so when you believe that diverse perspectives and uh, diverse experiences and, and things of that nature actually belong in your organization, uh, in your workplace, and you actually value and prioritize those perspectives, uh, that is us believing uh, that EDI has a place and that we believe it should belong in our environments. And so part of that believing that diverse perspectives and experiences belong in the workplace, uh, Elaine Wel Weltroth um, is a motivational speaker and she's been a publisher with uh, magazines and such. And she says, when you exist in spaces that weren't built for you, sometimes just being you is the revolution. 
And Elaine is a black woman, right? And so when we're talking about uh, black women, black men, we're talking about people of color, our indigenous brothers and sisters, et cetera. Part of believing us is believing when we tell you that our spaces are not built for us or that these spaces, um, that our profession, librarianship, library and information science is not built for us. And so you heard Pamela talk about her her scars and her war, ba war battle. Um, it, it is absolutely true, right? And part of having our allies and hopefully our accomplices help us improve these environments is believing the stories that we tell them. So culturally responsiveness is taking is, is a step further, if you will, than inclusion. And again, I loved uh, Pamela mentioning Ubuntu and this idea of humanity, right? Because we can't really believe, uh, much less lead with EDI values if we don't recognize and value the humanity of others. All right, so just very quickly, um, this silhouette picture is of a young man named Ralph Jarls who was shot uh, simply for going to the wrong door and ringing the doorbell, right? So when people say, I don't see color and everything is not about race, um, a lot's about race and we, we can't not see color, right? So this quote's important. Um, you can have all of the policy in the world, but if you don't have humanity for others, it's, it's none of it's going to be worthwhile or sustainable. So culturally responsive leadership, how are we leading with EDI action, right? So we believe in the values, hopefully, and now we need to actually act upon them. So just very quickly, um, culturally responsive leadership, there is a uh, body of literature in this area. You'll see it in business, uh, you'll see it in education, you'll see it specifically uh, in school librarianship as well. And culturally responsive leader, is one who recognizes the impact of institutionalized racism on their own lives and the lives of the students and families they work with and who embrace their role in mitigating, disrupting, and dismantling systemic oppression. To embody this definition means to work personally, interpersonally, and institutionally. And you'll see that uh, this definition is full of action words, right? Mitigating, disrupting, dismantling, uh, and doing the work. So this kind of leadership, culturally responsive leadership, is anti-racist, is anti-oppressive, it's community-based and empowering. It's also indigenous-focused. It's social justice and advocacy-based, okay? It's also inclusive of systems theory, and it talks a lot about cultural humility and cultural competence. And this type of leadership is also ongoing and requires a lot of internal self-work, uh, you could also refer to it as critical self-reflection, right? So this is not the type of work that we can do if you've not essentially gotten right with yourself, right? This is not the type of leadership that you can fake it till you make it or that you can just kind of phone it in. You actually have to believe this. It has to be um, similar to the definition. It's something that you have to embody. And that embodiment takes work. This type of leadership also challenges us to work towards the creation of an inclusive environment, and it demonstrates a willingness to learn from all people, right? So that's uh, part of the humility dimension as well. All right, so why does critic, uh, excuse me, culturally responsive leadership matter in practice? All right, so I'm gonna give you a couple of examples, um, and actually, please feel free to um, put your examples in the chat things that you may have experienced or seen uh, when culturally responsive leadership wasn't present. All right, so these are all real uh, examples that I have either encountered or have been told about by uh, personal colleagues, right? So we've got uh, accent issues. I have multiple colleagues uh, that have uh, discernible uh, verbal accents and, you know, routinely on their course evaluations or on their performance reviews, they'll see comments like they need to speak better English. They need to learn how to speak English better, right? So that means that that manager or that leader needs to address this in a culturally responsive way. 
On the right hand side, this was a social media post from um, a, a BIPOC librarian uh, who said essentially that they're tired of going to conferences and seeing uh, folks who don't do this work capitalizing on EDI values, right? So this is when things become co-opted, uh, when capitalism uh, is the name of the game. Um, and this is when things become trendy and people can get grant money or can get a conference uh presentation or maybe a, a journal issue or something in some way they're they're um, benefiting from a trend and not really uh, benefiting from the work that they do or actually believe in this is a screenshot uh, from the tops supermarket in Buffalo New York where they had that very tragic uh, racist shooting a couple of years ago uh, and the reason that I put this up, um, this is an example of believing people when they tell you things. Um, I was presenting with this same picture and just telling, you know, the audience how much this affected me uh, in the sense that a lot of the victims of this particular shooting were elderly African-Americans. And I made the comment that said and said, you know, I no longer let my mother go to the supermarket alone. And I don't, I still don't. Um, and someone said to me, well, that's a really dramatic response. And that was a distinct lack of cultural, culturally responsive leadership, right? I'm telling you that this affects me and your response is to be dismissive and to essentially name call, okay? So, you know, back to even that first quote where, you know, by uh, people of color, BIPOC folks, just showing up, sometimes that is the revolution and the revolution comes at a cost, right? So I think a lot of people have heard this particular uh, phrase. Um, it is, I think, meant to be a compliment, but it's really a microaggression. And you, I've been told many times, you're so articulate, you speak so well, right? And so my response is, I have three degrees, four if you count my undergrad degree. Um, I've been in school most of my life. I'm a college professor with tenure and rank. Why would you expect me not to be articulate or well-spoken? All right, so we need to be really mindful about our language and how we are addressing people. And it goes back to our assumptions and stereotypes and implicit biases, right? And that's why some of these things come out. And this is part of the critical self-reflection work. Racial slurs, um, you know, it's really uh, getting sticky out here nowadays uh, with the arguments of free speech and academic freedom. And I'm certainly not disparaging either one of those, but a racial slur is a racial slur and they should not be allowed. And a culturally responsive leader needs to put their foot down and needs to uh, set the stage, right? You cannot have an inclusive environment of belonging when people are actually being verbally assaulted. And I've been in multiple workplaces where racial slurs were allowed. This is a picture of a prayer room in a library. And, you know, it could be just a, even called a quiet space. It could be for nursing parents. It could be uh, for those who need to pray or maybe who just need um, quiet and, you know, low sensory experience. And the anecdote that I wanted to give you is a library director who said that they didn't have any um, physically impaired people coming to their library, so they didn't need to worry about it. When in fact, the library didn't have a, a wheelchair ramp. So it was physically impossible for those with um, some type of disability to enter, right? So this library director was completely not culturally responsive in his leadership. So it's his, his idea was, well, out of sight, out of mind, when we should be proactive and trying to get to know our communities and their needs and their, their cultural uh, pro uh, experiences and stories, right? And that should be informing how we lead uh, in our libraries. This is a book bike. Um, I think lots of towns have them now. I remember teaching a class um, and a young white woman was the uh, book cycle librarian at her library. And she was talking about how great it was and how she got to meet people in her community. 
And a black woman librarian in the class, she was brave enough to speak up. And she said, I would never ride the bike uh, cycle in my neighborhood. She's like, because I can guarantee you I'll get stopped. Right. And I'll, you know, I'll get questioned about why you're here and what you're doing. And she said, and I won't put myself in that position. So she had a culturally responsive leader who said, okay, you don't have to, you know, ride the bike, the bibliocycle. All right. So that was an example of a culturally responsive leader. All right. So this is uh, an example, a, a tweet uh, that was talking about resting B face. Right. And lots of women, uh, particularly women of color, are said uh, are called intimidating or uh, you're not approachable. You're, you're not smiling. Right. And this should never be part of the expectation of how someone should act. Right. Uh, physical appearance has has no room uh, in this conversation. So as a culturally responsive leader, we have to set the stage and we have to emphasize and be very clear about what will be uh, accepted and is unacceptable uh, in our workplaces. So I know, I don't know about you, but I hear this all the time. I don't know what to say, right? When faced with microaggressions or other inequities that are verbalized and enacted uh, in your presence, right? And so one of the things that I tell my students is that if you have to practice and even get a script to say, you know, why would you say such a thing? Or why did you think that comment was funny? Why would you make a remark about their religion? Why would you make a remark about their food? It could be a simple question, right? But if we have uh, the script or the resources and become comfortable with them, it will become second nature to be able to speak up and speak out when it's necessary. All right. So um, as Pamela mentioned in today's climate, uh, we no longer have the luxury of saying, I don't know what to say. So finally, um, I will put the uh, link in the chat uh, when we get to Q&A, um, but it's really important for culturally responsive leaders. And I should have said this earlier, when I say leaders, I mean all of us, right? We are all leaders in some way, shape or form, even if we don't have an explicit title. But as culturally responsive leaders, we need to stand in the gap, right? And that means that we need to speak up. We need to speak out, even when it's not comfortable for us. And we need to use our privilege. We all have privilege, we all have disadvantages, but we need to use our privilege uh, to work for the benefit of everyone. So operationalizing culturally responsive leadership. All right, and I can send the link uh, to this particular infographic. Um, and you can see the list here, right? And you, please notice that they are all action words, right? We're listening and acting with empathy. We are actually caring about others. We are embracing the strengths and the experiences of others. We are walking the walk. We are coaching and guiding others. We are taking risks and we are appreciating what others bring to the table. All right, so again, all action. And the more that we act, the more uh, part of our uh, leadership EDI will become. And so I have another link for you. I'll put that in the chat as well. And part of culturally responsive leadership is what I call leading with love. And that involves radical hospitality, where we are uh, essentially welcoming people. But again, from that, even that first slide that I showed you, when we welcome people, we actually believe that they belong in this space. Radical honesty, we are bringing our whole selves to the table, right? If we are expecting others uh, to reciprocate with that type of uh, openness and vulnerability, uh, we must meet them with our own vulnerability um, and just be willing to take a risk. We have radical love, all right? So again, um, another mention of language um, and we want to have the right language, right? We all have to keep up with how quickly language changes and 
particularly with language that belongs to a community of which we're not a part, right? So radical love is being proactive and seeking out experiences and making sure that we can understand and have empathy with other groups. Uh, and similarly, radical candor is another way of bringing your whole self to a particular situation and to communities who are different from you. And finally, radical empathy. There's also um, some emerging literature uh, about radical empathy as well. And radical empathy really kind of encompasses uh, the previous four radicals that I mentioned to you. Um, I do wanna point out for radical empathy that empathy, whether it's radical or not, uh, does not equal absolution, right? We're not doing this work uh, to assuage guilt or for optics. We're doing it because we believe it. And we're doing it even when it's messy or even when it's uncomfortable for us. Radical empathy um, also talks about knowing your emotions and being in touch with them and speaking from your own experience. And then finally, um, I'm sure some of you have heard this before, understanding the difference between intention and impact, right? We all make mistakes. Um, we will certainly make mistakes uh, when we're trying to uh, be leaders and it's just about uh, regrouping and, and apologizing and getting back to work. All right, so winding up here, unless there's a personal transformation, there can be no social transformation. Uh, and I like this particular quote from uh, James Baldwin. In 1963, he said, to any citizen of this country who figures himself as responsible, and particularly those of you who deal with the minds and hearts of young people, you must be prepared to go for broke. All right, so again, this is about risk-taking, right? So getting in there and being critically self-reflective and working your level best to become culturally responsive leaders and working uh, to maintain your culturally responsive leadership position. All right, so with that, um, thank you so much for your time and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm going to ask again, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat. I actually have a couple questions that I prepared just in case. And it looks like Sue has something and she says, Nicole, I believe you said that library science wasn't built for us. Could you correct me or say more about what you meant? Yeah. Um, so essentially what I meant is uh, librarianship is predominantly, or I use, I typically say it's librarianship is notoriously white. Um, depending on what uh, source you're looking at, uh, LIS is roughly 82 to 86% comprised of white women. And the profession was built for and by white women. Uh, certainly there are white men involved. Um, and when I say white, I'm not necessarily, um, I'm not trying to be disparaging. But what I'm saying is, is that we were all socialized with Western norms, right? So we have been socialized to think and value whiteness, affluence, heterosexuality, um, cisgender, and all of these things. And anyone who falls outside of those Western norms is other. Right. So when I say the profession was not built for me or built for other BIPOC professionals, that's what I mean. Um, and so I don't want to uh, short shrift my answer because it is a much uh, deeper and nuanced uh, conversation uh, to say such, you know, say, make this assertion. Um, but, you know, to give you a concrete and practical example, um, we have the Spectrum Scholarship. We have uh, various uh, minority scholarships that are designed to recruit people of color. We have amazing people coming through these programs. And in the last 20 years, thousands of people have come through these different programs and entered the profession. But over those 20 years, the percentage of minoritized groups in librarianship does has not moved, right? So we have maybe 
um, 6% African American, and it just goes lower and lower. Um, why does that number not increase when we're recruiting all of these people? Um, the answer is that we're not retaining them, right? And why are we not retaining them? Uh, in part, because people of color are going into uh, different libraries and different organizations and essentially are not made to feel welcome. They're made to feel like the profession is not for them. Uh, you know, lack of opportunity, there's lots of reasons for it. Um, but I think one of the main ones is this question is that we have entered professions, entered a profession uh, that was not built for us. And some people decide, you know, that it's, it's not worth it. Thank you, Dr. Cook. So I have a question for both uh, both of you, and and that is just share uh, some of your thoughts on intentionality. I know that's something that I talk about a lot, and I know Dr. Cook, you mentioned a little bit about intentional, but if if you both can just take a few minutes to just share some of your thoughts on on that intentionality that's required to do, you know, not just to do this work, but actually to apply it. Pamela, did you want to go first? Pamela, you go first. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, yeah, I'll go home first again. Um, I also wanted to just piggyback on Dr. Cook. So I present as white, and I can still tell you that these systems, um, there are a cult there are cultural things about being a Latina that are difficult to find inside of a library space. Um so those Western values, they don't, Latinos are mixed, we're mestizos. So there's, there even, even for me, what has been funny is that I am as pale as you get. And even then there's barriers that I consistently find. Um, so I think it, it's the mindset that you bring to these spaces if you're more collective. Um, so back to intentionality. So there is limited infrastructure for DEI when it's actionable. And I think we're emphasizing action because that's what is needed. As you're working in this space, you start to see all of the things that are not there. And so the intention, the motivation, what drives you into that space has to be a strong fire to basically see yourself through uh, because it's not it's not a paved uh, road. It's 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 like a cliff. It's like Mount Everest, and you're walking up. And so I think that that's why it's important to figure out what your why is. If your why is saviorship, or I'm going to look good, or it's a fad, it's going to be really hard to sustain that climb. Uh, the intentionality that seems to be the strongest is love, is this idea of, of, of loving people, the person in front of you as though it is yourself, and, and wanting the very best for the people around you, so that that is the intention that drives your behavior. Each of the way that you think is planting the seed of what will grow. So that's what I think about intentionality, which is why I'm being very careful of the projects that I take on so that what I am cultivating is very intentional and life-centric. Thank you, Pamela. Dr. Cook? Yeah, I just, again, um, just want to uh, wholeheartedly agree with everything Pamela said. Um, so intentionality... For me, it takes on a couple of um, dimensions, if you will. So I've always said uh, to myself and, uh, you know, to others that my main goal is to leave librarianship better than when I found it, right? And for me, that comes through in uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, and social justice work. And so intentionality, um, it comes in longevity, right? I've been doing this work for over 25 years. Um, intentional, intentionality comes with the decision internally that I've had to make that I'm going to keep going when somebody calls me angry 
or when I get the stereotypes, when I get the microaggressions. Um, I just had a conversation um, with my director before this call about something that's going on here. And, you know, what are the consequences for not supporting the work that I do as the Baker chair here in South Carolina? Right. And so the intentionality with that conversation is to make a conscious decision and make it verbal to say that I will not allow you to take advantage of me in the work that I'm doing. Now, is that a risk? Yeah, it is. Right. But I always talk about calculated risks. So I know what the consequences are. And I am intentionally saying I'm OK with that because I'm tired of you taking advantage of what I'm bringing to the table. Right. So we talked about the table a little earlier. Um, you know, and I think also I think it's important to mention that intentionality also um, requires me to think about when I need to take a break. Right. Because this work is so hard. Right. And it can be so isolating, which is, you know, one of the beautiful things about this webinar and other venues where we can have these conversations. Um, but when it gets too hard, I make a conscious decision to step back for a little bit and then I'll come back and, and start up again. Right. And I think it really goes back to what Pamela is emphasizing about um, essentially quality of life. Right. And intentionality of not letting uh, this work and, you know, the harsh reactions to this work damage me physically or mentally. Um, so I think there's lots of different ways to be intentional. Um, but I think it is a process. And I think it's something that we have to keep coming back to and, and reevaluating when necessary. So I just got the three minute mark. So I got one one other question that uh, because I don't see any in the chat. And this is one if you can answer it really quickly. But so and it's kind of a crazy question. But how do you know? If if what we if this work that we do and we and you, that if you're talking about, how do you know if it's working or in other words, is it something that we truly when when are we going to have the answer to if it's working and, or how do we measure it? So I'm going to let you start, Dr. Cook, really quickly. And then, yeah. Pamela, if you can if you can go after. Yeah, I it's a great question. Um, we may not have critical mass. Um, but I do absolutely think it's it's working. And one example I'll give you, um, because I'm in the library classroom and, you know, graduation is next week. For the 13 years that I've been teaching, every year I have had at least two students hug me and say, thank you for pushing me. Thank you for uh, challenging me. And this is, you know, coming in the form of coursework. And, you know, you can maybe tell from how I'm uh, interacting today, this is what the classroom's like. So I'm going to push you and make you uncomfortable. Um, and when people thank you for that, um, you can at least be hopeful um, that there is some change that we are bringing. Thank you. Pamela? And you know that it's working when it's bringing people together. So in the works where I see where you can create bridges across difference and where you can see people crossing them, everyone is on their different journey. But the moments when you start to see that, the, the inner transformation that happens with folks, which is a journey in itself, and the way that people are less judgmental, the, the, when, when they are less reactive, when they are uh, more curious, more in tune to another person, and they are interested in diminishing pain, I think those are the moments where I see, okay, this, this, this is working. Doesn't mean that there's not moments of conflict and tension, and and and, and um, where we're not seeing eye to eye, but that we are really interested in in kind of unpacking them and getting. Um, having a dialogue with one another. Excellent. We're at, excellent. You guys did perfect. Excellent. I want to say thank you to Nicole and Pamela, and now I'm going to turn it over to Sue to uh, close us out. Thank you. Oh, and I want to say thank you very much, too, to Nicole and Pamela. I'm sorry, we are limited by one hour. But as Deborah Hicks said at the beginning, um, we teach in the management area, and these webinars are 
posted and uh, encouraged for our students to see. So, you know, we try to make a difference where we can as well. I want to thank Calvin for being a uh, terrific moderator. And um, I will close it out thanking our participants as well. And I will have the recording sent to everyone after our IT person fixes it up the way they want to. So thank you again. I um, appreciate it very much. And to our um, speakers, if you wouldn't mind sharing your PowerPoints, I will post them along with the recording. But that, that's totally up to you, and we can talk offline. So thank you very much.